now it's uh, our time to have a fruitful discussion. And I just noticed that um, Professor Je Jexler just published a new book on the uh, German philosopher Gadamer. And I'm just curious how to combine these two in research interests together. Maybe you can you know, provide some of our, uh, your ideas on these um, two issues. But uh, before we do that, that um, I'd like to invite some of our discussions uh, from Taiwan to provide their viewpoints. And um, what I'm going to do is I will invite about two people at a time and uh, to provide their views and then we will come back to you and uh, you answer their questions or comments uh, for four minutes. So first I'd like to invite uh, Professor uh, Rong Yuan Huang and uh, he is professor from uh, um, Chinese Cultural University. Okay, it's very, it's very, very great to be here to share my my opinion and, and my study about NPM. Uh, the presentation that Dr. Chesler, oh, oh, sorry, sorry about this, it's, it's very solid and very clear and also very thoughtful presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, how many minutes I, I got? Uh, five minutes or ten? About five minutes, so it's quite short, okay. Okay, for many years, NPM has sex, 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 very sex, successfully change in how the public sector op operates. As we know, it makes modern government from rebellion, bureaucratic principle, which were regarded as a poor performance, inefficient, and a lot of blood red tapes, to a so-called post-bureaucratic model during these three decades. Um, most governments in the world now are pursuing more economic, more effective, and more efficient governance, the so-called 3E, okay? Uh, what we can show today is uh, that the public sector in the near future, I mean, maybe 10 years, within 10 years, will also be managerial, I think, especially in Taiwan or the other developing countries. It pre pre presents the governments will continuously pay attention to the achievement of results, a focus on market orientation, and emphasize their performance. As Dr. Cheshler has mentioned, however, the MPM applies to governmental practice has also attracted many critics. Uh, for example, some argue that the, the, the MPM adopts the worst feature of the pri private management uh, with uh, pay no regard to fundamental differences in public sector and with, uh, with, uh, with, with the private se se sectors. Also, some critics uh, say the NPM somehow against the traditions and value of uh, public service and even become on democratic service delivery or bring about the people alienation or some, something like that. I'm not going to reaffirm the criticism of, to the MPM, but what I'm trying to do is uh, giving Taiwanese cases uh, to raise some questions regarding to the relation between the MPM or the government performance with better governance. Uh, as I show in the, 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 the slide, I have identified some questions here. Uh, there would be what are good results in terms of public management and what is good performance of government. Any, are there different uh, MPM in different countries? Uh, what is the relationship between performance and people's satisfaction? And is it a guarantee for winning their re-election? I mean, maybe the the politician's reduction is very important for, for them. Due to the time limit, so I just give one example. Uh, this example is about the uh, present Mayan Jews' governmental performance. And its uh, re-election is 2012 presidential elect uh, election. As we know, the 2012 Taiwanese presidential election was uh, particularly tense. In fact, 
the pre-election opinion polls had shown almost no difference of support proportion between two major groups, as uh, Mr. Ma and, and Ms. Chai. That's the, the figure I quote from a, a, a TV, TV program. And it shows the percentage of uh, support to three groups, groups of candidates in the 2000, November, November of two, 2012. As the as a picture, you can you can you can you can tell you can see there had only about three percent differences, or maybe less three percent between Ma and Chai within one month before polling days. And in fact, in fact, the performance of Ma's administration during the uh, 2008 to 2012 is not, uh, not very, very bad. And I give two, two examples. The Global Competitiveness Report made by WEF. Taiwan gains number, number 13 spot in 2011 among the 144 economists worldwide in overall ranking. Advancing gradually in the past four years from 7, 7, 17th place in 2007 to 2008 report. The second is Chinese, Chinese Vision, Vision magazine, Yuanjian. Uh, in January 20th of uh, 2011, the satisfaction and trust of Taiwanese people to Ma Yingzhou had risen respectively in January, in which satisfaction reached the second high since taken office in 2008. And the confidence was the highest point since June of 2009. However, the final result had actually gap with the prediction. Mind you, with about the six percentage won the election. So some people, some, some scholar uh, doing the election study, they say, the Taiwanese people, Taiwanese voter, will take a position or valence ground rather than performance calculation to, to take the vote. Overall performance of mass administration in some way did not reflect on the opinion polls, as we know. Again, mass win in the 2012 president ele election was namely because of the people adopted position voting strategy, but not considered performance of his administration. Oh, that's my, my study about the, the two, two, 2012 uh, presidential election. Okay, uh, well, because the time limit, I'm, I'm, I'm just jump to my conclusion. Uh, I, would not, I, I would never oppose the value and his uh, contribution of the MPM, but I think here, must uh, emphasize the role of citizen participation. Uh, like, just like uh, Dr. Yu said, shift to the citizen orientation. I, I, I think this is most important. Uh, what the matter in public sector are all about the politic of not only just the managerial. That's my point and in very immature. And thank you for your attention. And now I would like to invite the second uh, discussant, uh, Professor Jun Yi Xie. Um, he's from the Taipei Jiaoyi Dao. I don't really. University of Taipei. Oh, University of Taipei. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Dressler, the uh, uh, good nature. And uh, uh, I. I I, I just uh, uh, talk about uh, something about uh, uh, a new public management. Um, uh, I, I seen uh, a professor that uh, Dresser have uh, uh, one uh, article and uh, talk about the uh, uh, Chinese uh, dynasty, uh, Song Dynasty, the Wang An Shi. Uh, it, it write the article and also the he talk about uh, uh, some the other article is the talk about. Uh, uh, compares compare the uh, uh, Western and the Chinese and uh, 
uh, Eastern uh, uh, governments. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, Professor Dresser uh, uh, very focused on the compare uh, the Eastern and the Western uh, uh, related to the PA uh, paradigm, the PA the governments. So, um, but I, I, I some have uh, some uh, maybe can uh, f uh, feel a, a discussion about uh, uh, how to we can judge the uh, uh, good governments. They they maybe have uh, some uh, judge judge the criteria. For example, the democracy or citizen satisfaction or uh, even the uh, administrative performance or finance or financial uh, crisis. So we. We can think uh, uh, even uh, 20 uh, years ago, the, uh, the new party management, the, the orange the, in the uh, uh, Western uh, advanced country. Uh, after the, uh, right now, the some of the country, they counter, uh, maybe they face the financial crisis. So uh, how to, the, I mean, uh, even the in for the, the teacher the uh, public administration uh, uh, student, uh, how to uh, perceive the student the new public management uh, uh, provide a good uh, pres prescription. Uh, uh, they can a uh, good provide a good way to uh, reform the government and uh, also in in no matter the government uh, the government agents uh, agency and machine. So this uh, may be the new party management the problem. But I think the new party management maybe have a one of a, a PA, the paradigm. They, they may be that after the 10 year, the new uh, paradigm uh, replaced the new party management. So uh, th this uh, may be the history, the trend. So uh, this are the other issue. The third one, uh, after the, the, the professor, the uh, translator, I think the the, the, I mean, the, uh, the meta, the support, the uh, uh, factor is uh, from the uh, culture. Maybe the culture the factor influence, uh, even we have a good idea and good uh, the, the uh, PA, the, uh, uh, the uh, idea to, to different country. However, they, 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 they in, in, impact a different uh, result and in different performance. For, uh, for, for example, in a Confucianism uh, nation, for example, the uh, mainland China, Japan, uh, Korean, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and uh, Singapore, uh, uh, they, they now have uh, become a uh, uh, more advanced country uh, around the uh, global. So maybe the the other reason uh, influence the new public management, even the reform government, the implementing government, is uh, from the uh, cultural factor or uh, religious. Uh, the, the, the influence. So we can, if we look at the maybe uh, Eastern the culture, uh, Eastern the country, I think the little country they they perform uh, in uh, economic and the social and the also the, the link the top uh, in around the, the global. So maybe the they have uh, some uh, important uh, uh, fate influence. Uh, a PA, the innovative art, uh, idea. Uh, I think the most in, the important is a, a cultural uh, fit. And the, the the next one I want to uh, I want to talk about uh, what what's next. Uh, uh, after the new public management, a uh, new or uh, even the the, the uh, 40, uh, 40 years ago new public administration. What's next? Uh, is uh, also the uh, West, uh, Eastern, the uh, dom dominant, uh, uh, graduate, uh, the uh, dominant uh, the country, or the the Western also the uh, control the PA agenda, a uh, gro global agenda uh, around the world. Uh, be this uh, because uh, when uh, we talk about uh, the PA, the uh, the uh, in uh, teaching the uh, PA student. We instill the more uh, the Western the PA uh, uh, reference idea, but uh, not many, uh, not many the the, the Chinese uh, case, a uh, local case uh, to teaching our uh, PA student. So this uh, may be uh, the, the the other problem. So uh, what's next? Uh, the uh, maybe the the uh, Eastern case uh, will. Uh, 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 talk about uh, the Western uh, 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 PS student 
the East uh, maybe have uh, uh, the other uh, uh, good uh, story can uh, the teacher their their PA uh, uh, behavior. So this uh, maybe the other story of how to uh, teach a uh, uh, future uh, PA student is a local study, local case or Western case or Eastern case. Uh, this is uh, the other issue. Uh, finally, I think the global PA uh, paradigm maybe the something like the uh, uh, policy convergence. Uh, uh, they, they, something the other Fukuyama said uh, maybe democracy will be, become the, the end of the history. Uh, also, the, uh, but the, the democracy is a good, good, good way to uh, converge the, the old uh, uh, country. Uh, this uh, maybe we can talk about this. So global PA idea maybe uh, need to uh, more uh, depend on the uh, IT and information technology uh, in assistance, uh, for them such as uh, Facebook. Uh, when we when I go to the uh, mainland China, I cannot uh, uh, go uh, 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 I mean go into the uh, website to uh, uh, talk. Uh, I mean search my uh, Facebook. Uh, this uh, maybe the the information technology influence the uh, the future the uh, uh, PA the uh, history of PA uh, the Eastern and Western uh, PA dialogue. Okay, so uh, these are uh, my uh, uh, discussion. Okay, thank you. Very insightful uh, questions, especially from the Francis Fukuyama's end of history and to the non-Western public administration, especially the Confucian and uh, Islamic countries, and more importantly, where to go. So now I return to Professor Drexler to uh, provide some answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I have to be brief because these two great comments would normally lead me now to talk for about two hours. Really, two hours, because these are the interesting things. What was very interesting for both your comments is that they shift the attention actually away from NPM and to governance. And this, this is actually a new topic, and one has to, to, to open it all anew, and this is very interesting. For your last remark, by the way, to access Facebook in mainland China costs you $4.50 over a VPN. Everybody there has it. If you have the great firewall of China and you can overcome it with $4.50, I don't think there is no firewall. It's just a little economic discrimination. I, as I said, I was a professor in Beijing at the heart of the dragon, and I used Facebook every day. So. Oh yeah, uh, everybody does, all my colleagues, all my students. This, this is the thing. Um, as you know, mainland China is a highly ambiguous system with a facade that everybody pays lip service to and nobody believes it. I have, in my entire time in Beijing, not met a single Marxist, but about 80% of hardcore Confucians. That was interesting. Now, when you mentioned Francis Fukuyama, and his convergence of democracy, that is the old Francis Fukuyama from about 25 years ago, a quarter of a century. What we saw this and last year is one of the most, the, the most interesting and important debate in governance was again led by Fukuyama with a series of articles, especially in the journal Governance, which is the number one journal in governance including an article called What is Governance? with a lot of responses, including Bo Rothstein and Kishore Mahbubani and so on. And we get to a very key question here. The key question right now debated in governance, and it is a question that emotionally breaks my heart to ask in Taiwan, is can we have good governance without democracy? And a large part of the key Asian thinkers say, yes, you can deliver high quality services. You have, especially in Asia, authoritarian regimes that clearly provide a higher quality of life, more economic growth, and even more justice and liberty than democracies. And that is horrible because it shouldn't be so. But if you ask me, if I were accused of a crime and I would go in front of a court in an EU member country democracy like Romania or in Singapore, I would prefer Singapore. And Singapore is very proud of not being a democracy. 
Of course, in the global competitive report that you cited, Singapore is the number two country in the world and the leading Asian country. And by the way, in your list of the Chinese and Confucian countries, if we talk about the Chinese cultural sphere, it's not only China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, and so on and so on, but the two countries which are also Confucian is curiously enough Vietnam, but most importantly Singapore. Singapore looks like multicultural. In reality, it's classically Chinese. And it is one of the few countries where they say we are Confucian, hierarchical, top-down, oriented towards growth and happiness of the citizens. Taiwan has such a great story of overcoming authoritarianism, moving into democracy. To say in Taiwan democracy is not that great or not that important is horrible. But that is what the debate right now is. And, and this, this is very important. And this is, again, Kishore Mahbubani who commented on that, the famous Asian expert, the, the former dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Governance at the uh, National University of Singapore, probably the number two university in Asia after the University of Tokyo, I think it's the number one, says this very clearly. If you want to have a decent life, you shouldn't have democracy because people just vote in a certain way and that might lead to more problems than answers. This is the current debate. And the interesting thing is that the high performing Asian authoritarian or semi-authoritarian regimes that we have are top-down classical Confucian bureaucracies and not this NPM, but they choose it. The great thing about Singapore, I always come back to Singapore, is that they say, we do classical bureaucracy, top-down, lots of money, highly Confucian, and we pick from all this American stuff what we think works, but what we think doesn't work, never mind. So they have a very strong position. Mm -hmm. And that is important in this context uh, when we are talking about the different paradigms. Very briefly, maybe I talk about it later, but I want to be brief now. There are people who believe there is one global PA, as I said in the beginning. I think we have a dominating global PA, but in reality we have different paradigms. And one, the number one paradigm challenging the Western paradigm potentially is indeed what we call Confucian PA. Now, to what extent Confucianism is just a codification of traditional Chinese thought or whether traditional Chinese thought is Confucian is a big debate amongst philosophers right now, but let's use it as a code word of classical Asian PA. Of course, I, I am, as I said, not a Taiwan expert, but um, first, one thing is really horrible and that is I am speaking to you in English. I shouldn't. And I feel truly, this is not, I'm not saying it out of politeness, but I feel extremely guilty for not being able to speak Chinese because I am actually really of the opinion that the greatest civilization in humankind is actually the classical Chinese culture, more than the Western one. Western one is a close second. Um, and if you don't speak Chinese as I do, in the end, you're just a stupid peasant boy. There is no question about that. This said, but this is very important, as Fukuyama now says, the modern state, modern administration, and modern bureaucracy arose in classical China out of the need to administer a too large country in a centralized way without IT or any mass communication. So you needed to, uh, to build such a system, which happened and worked extremely well. You know the most successful PA institution ever was the Imperial Civil Service Exam longest lasting PA institution ever, and absolutely brilliant. Although Wang Angshu had a couple of problems with that, such as that it ex uh, educated generalists rather than specialists. Now, this is one of the most exciting things. Again, as I can only scratch the surface, and you all know this so much better than me. But uh, this is why we now at the IIAS, the uh, Institut International Admi uh, de Sciences Administratives, the main international uh, PA organization, will have from next year a study group on Confucian PA. Because so far, all the stuff you get also from mainland was always how successfully have you adopted administrative reforms from America. As I mentioned before, when I was in Korea at the beginning of my sabbatical, I heard that 80% of all the textbooks for students have American case studies. Who cares what people do in Ohio? And remember one thing, you can learn a lot of things from America, but surely not PA. 
The US does not have a functional administrative system, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> if you go to an American PA conference, what do you hear? Complaints, complaints, complaints. <laughs> no money, no competence, no satisfaction. That is what you get in America. On the other hand, as we had in your paper, by the way, number 17, global competitive report is as it is, but it is an indicator. Clearly, let me as an outsider say that. One of the things that show you how mature and advanced Taiwan is, is that in my personal, if I may make a small judgment on Taiwan, from all Asian countries that I know, nowhere do people complain more about their government than in Taiwan. Taiwan is incredibly self-critical, but self-criticism is a sign of achievement and freedom. Where citizens complain about government, the government is actually better than where they don't. There are countries in it. You know what is the country where people complain the least about government in Asia? It's actually Vietnam. By a research by Professor Berman, actually. In Vietnam, everybody says the government is fine. Why? Because if you say the government is not fine, you have a problem. So, that sometimes obscures the fact, also came out in your paper, that Taiwan is one of the most successful countries in the world, especially looking at the odds. That means at the cards are stacked against Taiwan for political reasons. On this basis, one of the most successful countries in the world, and I know it when I'm here, this idea of working infrastructure. In Taiwan, if you open a water crane, water comes out of it. That's not normal. And it's clean water that doesn't smell, and it's hot if it says hot. That is already amazing. And on a higher level, 17, then you have to distract all these Scandinavian and Benelux countries. They don't count small, rich, northern European nations. In the end, this is one of the great success stories. Life quality is incredibly high. That means that actually there is very little reason for self-criticism. But what does, from a governance perspective, make Taiwan special? If, as I said a few minutes ago, one of the most interesting paradigms is Confucian administration, is Asian administration at all. Once we evaluate that, what does make Taiwan special? If I may say this in all care, and don't hate me for that, but of course it is Taiwan that carries the legacy of imperial China more than anything else. In this sense, this is the place where also, I realized that the Kuomintang, of course, was opposed to imperial China. This is the original revolution against imperial China, but still, it carries most, more of it than mainland China. Mainland China is now trying desperately to go back to Confucius and everything like that, but there were a time in mainland China where Confucius temples were destroyed and where there were slogans like, down with Confucius and Lin Biao, right? I mean, it was a crime to be a Confucian. Now everybody is Confucian. If you are a political philosophy guy at Renmin University or Tsinghua University or Beijing University or Fudan University, you're all oh, Confucius and so on, but it's new. Here you have the Confucian legacy almost uninterrupted. Down to the language, same with the opera. If you want to see a Kunshu opera in Beijing, my God, you know, compared to here. And why? Because if you interrupt traditions, they are very difficult to recreate, like monarchy. If we now stop the kings in England, they never come back. Kings don't come back. They only work if they are uninterrupted. And here in Taiwan, they are not interrupted. So in the current debate, what everybody would expect here in Taiwan is discussions about classical Confucian public management. Whether you have it or not, that's all up to you to do this or not do this, and how much American you do and how much personal you do. But the big potential is this, clearly. And, and, and this, is, this is where it's gelling, especially because Taiwan seems to be able to combine it, like only Japan and South Korea, with democracy. Because it would still be nicer to have this with democracy than with authoritarianism, unless you're a Singaporean. <laughs> then, of course, it's nice. Finally, again, uh, to, to Professor Huang and the question of votes, this is very important. If we have democracy, people want to be re-elected. Number one reason for a democratic politician is to be re-elected. How important is PA reform for that? Well, the following results I think research shows. First, from the beginning of human civilization, people complain about bureaucracy. It's normal. They always do. Like the complaint about the youth. 
Any time you go in world history, old people say, oh, the children, they are so loud, they listen to bad music, and they have funny haircuts. It's normal. Just as it say, oh, the evil bureaucracies, they make a lot of money, and they just sleep, and they are boring. This is normal. But in reality, politicians often assume a public management reform rhetoric because they think it influences election decision making. But as far as we know, you know, we are PA professors. We know how important PA is, and it's our lives. But for normal people on the street, PA is one of the most boring fields in the world. If you have these newspaper reports, if a normal citizen, think about some people you know who are not PA guys, and they read the daily newspaper, and there is a quarter page article about public sector salary reform in the provincial government. How many of your friends are going to read this? This is something you skip over and go to the sports pages, or some recent scandal amongst the Korean boy group. You know, that is what people want to read, not PA reform. So actually, um, Politicians borrow a PA rhetoric that they think is important, but very often don't carry through. Sometimes, as you say, even performance doesn't matter but imaging. So that is the big achievement of Finland, to talk about reforms all the time and look cool, but in reality do a solid reform. Because what we also do know, and that goes a bit back to the democracy thing and also to this confusion thing, what we also do know is what most citizens in most countries at most times in history want, in spite of IT and Facebook and Twitter, is not so much an impact as a well-working PA. They, most people would like if the state works nice, fair, just and cheap, and they don't have anything to do with this. They would like the government to be on another side, not vote on it all the time but to function in a decent way. The problem is if citizens don't check it, they don't function very well with few exceptions. We come back to Singapore. But um, I think this is, a, this is a very important point. Most people would actually prefer a government that works well and doesn't bother them because people don't want to be bothered by democracy. They want, but they want it to work. Whenever they have an accident, they want to go to a place and get the money quickly and help and all of that, right? So this is the issue that we have right now. Um, wildly interesting, highly controversial. This is the cutting edge of PA scholarship right now, exactly these questions, so I can only answer this with these headlines. Of course, I can take one more about that, how to conceptualize the different paradigms, but I really need to quit now to have other people opportunity to talk. Or confidence toward Taiwan and the Taiwanese democracy. And now I'd like to invite uh, Professor Jun Yuan Huang. Um, he's from the... Uh, University of uh, Central Police. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Chairperson Professor Xu uh, because uh, of his invitation of us so that we can gather here together. And also, I appreciate your invitation during these past three years. Uh, uh, just like Professor Huang, I did learn a lot during these three years' conferences. And uh, I am also appreciate the professor uh, Jack uh, Jackster uh, because he just gave us a talk yesterday in Central Police University, and uh, he talked about uh, innovation in public sector. Does uh, does innovation exist in public sector? And uh, most of our uh, student uh, they have a very positive response of your uh, speech. So. Uh, both of this speech this morning and also uh, the speech yesterday, I really uh, very impressive and uh, also learned a lot of your speech. Uh, so regarding to your speech this morning, first of all, I'd like to say I totally agree with you uh, about, you know, you mentioned that uh, there's uh, no absolutely correct or wrong of ideologies, just like, uh, uh, you know, you, you mentioned about new uh, liberals and also other uh, ideologies. And you also uh, provide five approaches, uh, very well organized approaches of uh, the field of PA, just like uh, uh, Weberian and also uh, NPM and also just like uh, uh, new Weberian state and uh, new public governance and so on. 
Uh, being a scholar, uh, of course, people may not care about uh, what we do or what the next step from newspaper. But being a scholar, I would say that uh, it's our duty to realize the pros and cons uh, of these different approaches. Uh, for example, I would say that uh, you know, uh, Taiwan probably will be a Weberian uh, state uh, even right now. You know. A uh, couple of days ago, uh, I'm also organizing a conference in police uh, in my university, and I need to discuss the budget with uh, account, uh, account, accounting office. Is there any accounting officer no. here in this room? No. Uh, I was. I always. Uh, uh, I always complain to to them because you know there's a budget form right here, and I need to check with them. Is can I apply for this one? And they will answer according to this rule. I'm sorry, so <laughs> so that's a, a lot of problems, you know. So uh, I won't say that uh, uh, new public management will be better, or you know, again, there's no uh, uh, absolutely right answer about about these ideologies. But uh, uh, I will say that uh, it is very important for us or for the students in PA to know uh, the advantage that advantages and limitations of these different kind of approaches. For example, I usually uh, use one example uh, in my class to a student, May maybe a very simple example. I will ask my students, uh, if, you right, if right now you have uh, $1,000 and you can do two things. The first one is you can invest uh, yourself, just like you can go to buy uh, textbooks so that you can pack the exam and then you can uh, get a credit and maybe you can find a good job, so on, uh, things like this. And the other choice you can do is uh, probably you can use these $1,000 and buy some good meals and take care of your boyfriend or girlfriend uh, so that you, you, you will be very happy uh, this weekend. And I will uh, like them to make a choice. And some people will, some students will say that uh, I will go the first one. I will invest myself because I'm young. I, I need to earn more money. And you know, just a couple of days ago, uh, there are uh, many in-service students in my class. They answer that they will uh, take care of their family. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe you know, different various choices. And I will talk to them. Uh, you know, if you chose. If you take the uh, first one, you invest yourself. Uh, will your family complain about uh, your study, or you know, uh, will your family, you, your wife, your uh, your uh, husband, or your you know friends will uh, complain you? You don't uh, accompany with me during this weekend. Okay, that's one thing. And if you uh, choose the, the second option, you take care of your family, and who can earn money for this? Okay, and some students will say, uh, "Professor, can I do health and health?" Sure, you can spend five hundred dollars to to buy textbook. However, uh, you know you can just buy health book so that you pass a uh, midterm, but you fail in the final. And you can also you know spend five hundred uh, with your family, but originally you want to uh, take them uh, to a very good uh, steakhouse. But 500, you can you can only buy uh, you know some like uh, fast food, McDonald's or uh, uh, KFC. Okay, so and that's another problem. Uh, the fourth choice, uh, I I will this really few students will answer this, but I will remind them that you can also do both of these two things at the same time very well. You know because uh, you. You, you can you know spend one thousand here and spend another thousand here, but at this time you need to uh, borrow some money. Okay, that's another problem, and uh, I would say Taiwan or many other government will face this problem. That's national debts. So uh, the you know just through this example, I, I just want to say that uh, probably we need to realize what is the role of government they want to take and what is the you know pros and cons of the uh, road taking. So that's the second thing I want to share. And the last one is, 
uh, from the perspective of uh, doing research, I also like to uh, you know raise uh, very small questions to Professor Jackster. You just mentioned about the success and uh, success of NPM uh, and also the death or maybe failure of uh, NPM. Uh, can you talk uh, tell us some more details about the definition or how how you uh, or how the literature major on the success or failure. So that's the first thing. And the second one is, a couple of years ago, uh, we, uh, just like Professor She, Professor Zhang, Yan Yi, uh, we have a research team and we uh, did the survey on public servant uh, about more than 2000 and uh, that is a very good survey and we put on several uh, questions on that questionnaire just like uh, uh, the you know the current uh, status of uh, MP, uh, I, I, I won't say NPM because you, uh, I agree with Professor Jackson again uh, there are a lot of concepts or you know a lot of uh, you know uh, different policies in NPM just like contracting out privatization, cutting money, or you know, something like this. We ask about this, uh, or maybe toolbox will, will be more appropriate. And we uh, uh, add some questions about this to ask, que uh, to ask public servants about their attitude toward these uh, uh, policies. Uh, however, I also uh, realized that we did not have a very good uh, research design because that that is just a byproduct of the latter questionnaire. So maybe in the future, I would like to uh, again to invite some of uh, colleagues sitting here and to think about uh, some research project about uh, what is the impact of NPM or uh, the policies of NPM impact on civil servant. We won't maybe we we won't care a lot. Uh, a uh, very large scope of you know how they impact on government, but we you know in the field of PA we will care about how they in impact on civil servant. Okay, so that's all my comment. Thank you, uh, Professor Wang, and he talked a lot about the uh, gave us some examples and also about the management from uh, Professor Jexler's um, example. Now I would like to invite our very Professor Zhou Peng Liao uh, from the University of Open, National Open University to provide um, his uh, viewpoints. Uh, we have a marvelous lecture uh, in this morning. Uh, I want to anchor you, one of your opinions. You are talking about uh, most of the successful uh, NPM country is rich country, and the younger suction country. Uh, I want to anchor this point and, and uh, share about my observation of Taiwan experience. Uh, actually, uh, according to Taiwan, uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, the government reform nearly 70 years since 1949, uh, uh, after the Kuomintang uh, come, uh, uh, betrayed from mainland China to Taiwan. But in the uh, first uh, 40 years, we are trying to build a barbarian government. Okay, uh, most of the effort is uh, delivered to create or enhance the political control by the ruling party. But after that, in the last uh, 30 years, we begin our uh, government reform and introduced the idea of inventing government, yeah, reinventing government since the 1990s. But uh, interesting is uh, since the 19, uh, 1990s to 2000s, the uh, economic growth in Taiwan is uh, average is uh, over 6% GDP. And uh, many uh, media call the Taiwan uh, economic miracle of the war in that time, but uh, we choose in that we in the same time we choose to reinventing our government and borrow the NPM idea uh, from uh, the uh, Western countries. But 
as a compare this today, our GDP growth is nearly 1%. What is wrong with uh, if we do in our government reform nearly 20 years, why we from a rich country and the, the economic growth is getting down? Why is the reason? So I want to anchor your observation about this. And the firstly, I, I, have, I was a government employee for nearly 10 years. And according to my observation, I, I think um, there are some reason about this. Firstly, uh, according to the uh, United States uh, academics, uh, nearly we discussing about the collaboration governance. They are talking about the public and the private should collaborate, collaborate each other and to recreate our public services. But according to this concept, a successful collaboration governance, we need two important factors, which are the trust, especially the public service commitment, and uh, the shared, according to the John Donahue's uh, uh, opinion, is the shared discretion, or we can say the shared authority. And, uh, Third is the uh, resource uh, exchange or resource dependence each other, interact, interchange. So if we look carefully about these factors and compare to the, uh, the public governance, uh, we, we can find very interesting or uh, contradictive uh, perspective is that According to the dance from the political uh, dimension, according to the uh, political dimension, we um, prefer the representative, responsive, and uh, um, accountability of government. But when we introduce the collab collaborative governance idea and compare to this political dimension, we we find conflict between each other. For example, how can we share the discretion with the private sector? The government, that will distort our accountability way. So uh, they, they will uh, increase or they will um, event uh, two uh, contradictional results. The first one is the political appointed commitment will be destroyed. And the second one is the administrative commitment will be destroyed too. So then we can go back to the uh, best uh, or the original questions. Uh, if the MPA, uh, if we ins insist on the uh, reform of MPA uh, way, how can we solve this contradiction about the uh, political commitment and uh, the collaborative uh, governance? And uh, my question is, uh, according to the Taiwanese experience uh, or other country experience in the global war, can we go back, how can we go back to the new Bavarian uh, way? to do our public administration reform. Thank you. Well, um, to, to answer the last question first, I, I would personally really say NPM is so dead. To base new reforms of NPM is really ludicrous. What one should do, if one goes the avenues you have described, this is when you should look into what's called the new public governance. That means, if you like NPM so much that you want to save it today, you do new public governments, meaning NPM stuff with the lessons learned. But this pure 1980s style, even the most harsh pro-NPM guys in PA, almost all of them, would say that it has, for instance, a horrible coordination problem and a horrible authority and trust problem. And this is not viable. This is dead. If you want to do it today, you do it this way. Um, 
As far as the trust issues, by the way, is concerned, I think the most, uh, the best recent literature on that is uh, by uh, Professor John Halligan from the Australian National University, together with Professor Gerd Bucher, whom I mentioned before. So they have written a lot of essays and books recently on this idea of trust, not only on the side of the citizens, but also the trust in the citizens by the civil service, which is very important on that side. That just as a literature hint. Um, I really like this, uh, the points you two made on, on, on Taiwan and the idea on the research. The thing is, as I said, for me, the idea of talking about how Confucian is Taiwanese civil service and how Confucian should it be, for me, is the most interesting. Little civil service things there and, and empirical stuff of how does this work? Yeah, it's nice, we do this, but that's not really hot. Really hot is Confucianism in, in Taiwan. But we all know, we talked about this this morning actually in the car towards here, the pressure we as scientists are under because science, global science right now, and I understand also in Taiwan, is actually measured in an NPM way by primitive performance indicators such as like things that are even older than NPM, namely how many articles have you written in top journals, which, you know, articles are input, not output. Why do you measure this? But anyway, if we assume that all of us need to write top articles for top journals, very simply, not only do intellectual stuff, but also this, I have to say that careful empirical studies of how well, what you suggested, NPM reforms have worked in Taiwan are precisely the articles that go very fast into top journals because that's precisely what the people in JPART and PAR want to read. So this is a very, very smart research strategy to do what you were saying and it's, it's you know, really, if you have a nice piece by seven professors who so all of them get then lifted up there and so on, this is nice and it's also not totally uninteresting, of course, because we are now at a time which evaluates the so-called third phase of NPM reforms empirically. As I said and as I gave you the the direct references, most research shows didn't work. What do I mean with it didn't work? That was your precise question to me. What are the criteria for success or failure? As always in methodology, there are two levels. If we evaluate the success or failure of public administration reform, we have two criteria. First, by its own standards, and second, by an independent set of standards. So, the one thing is if we have an NPM reform that says we want this to be cheaper, like we want civil service delivery in, in, in Swansea cheaper, the first check we do is did it get cheaper? And it's an accounting question. And the second question is, was it a good idea to start civil, civil uh, public sector reforms just based on whether it's cheaper or not? Aren't there other reasons? And then, then you evaluate it. The current most important work, uh, it was the first phase of critique of NPM that evaluated NPM reforms by saying it reduced the state into what Alan Schick called a hollow state in his famous case study about New Zealand. So the criteria were wrongly set, but this was the first wave of NPM critique. Today's NPM critique is to say, even by its own standards, better service delivery for less money, NPM was a failure. That means people like Hood or uh, Stephen van der Waal, they look at classical Anglo-American PM reforms that said, look, we are NPM. Not ambiguous, but very clear. Privatization, contracting out, public-private partnerships. And then measure from ex post facto, because now we have all the data, all the papers. It's usually also open, because we now have quarter of a century, so they are not secret anymore. And we just look at the picture and say, is it cheaper or not? Or did they deliver more or not? Or we ask the people, do you like this better or not? And you have very simple, straightforward results. And the answers overall, as I mentioned this year, are no, they're not cheaper. And that has various reasons, partially economic reasons, um, that go there. Um, one thing I still want to mention as far as you are concerned, and this is, uh, your points is concerned, and this is, this is um, Weberianism as a tool for a strong state. So that it's, an, it's a bureaucratic power tool to reign through. But an interesting thing is 
that actually very often uh, contemporary dictatorships prefer NPM. NPM was very much loved by all kinds of tyrants. Why? Why would that be? You know who's one of the biggest fans of NPM? Vladimir Putin, the ruler of Russia, who certainly brings us back to criminal states. That's not a nice guy. We call this, in political theory, reactionary modernism. So we use modern things for reactionary purposes. Why would Putin be interested more in NPM than in Weberian stuff? The answer is an interesting one. What is very often depicted as one of the drawbacks, one of the negative sides of Weberianism is that it creates what is called an imperial bureaucracy. That means a bureaucracy that rules by itself and does not subject to political control. And this is anti-democratic. That means the bureaucrats do what they do best and what they know. And in a long-term Weberian service, if you are a department deputy head in a British ministry, 30 years, you know your field, you, are, you, know, you have an aristocracy title and so on and so on. You don't care who's minister, you do your own politics and you know it better. This was seen as one of the biggest disadvantages of classical hierarchical civil service. You could almost make the same point with, by the way, classical Mandarin civil service from the Confucian perspective. But in times of political dictatorship, this has an advantage. If civil servants do not comply with politicians and the politicians are tyrants, then it's actually good that the civil servants do this because they can be the last check and balance towards a negative regime. That is why Putin doesn't want a career civil service because always it happened also in communism before. East Germany is a perfect example. If you have a barbarian bureaucracy, it will automatically develop into a second center of power. Classic example, the Ottoman Empire, where the bureaucrats, who was the sultan, who was not the sultan, they did their stuff and they can do it very well. So there is, if you will, an imperial civil service, also a, a resistance moment. And so it's not only implementation of the power, but also challenge of the power at the same time. So once again, we are in ambivalence. Things in PA are usually not clear cut, this or the other, but they're both, and it's a balancing question. And that brings me to my last point, to, to the two of you going back to Confucian administration, because it was always a classical problem. Isn't Confucian um, administration, this kind of classical administration, too top-down, too much people from upstairs telling the people below what they should like? Uh, isn't that bad for the economy? Doesn't that leave any space for development? Well, the classic Confucian idea of administration, and also the Confucian idea of governance, as you know, is not unchallenged. You do have obedience upstairs and you have a strong civil service, but they must deliver. And that belongs, which came out in a lot of your papers, all four, that entails economic growth. A classic Chinese administration that does not lead to economic growth and development does not work. And if it doesn't work, you don't owe it any more respect. On the level of the emperor, we call that the mandate of heaven. If you don't deliver, you lose the mandate of heaven, and if you lose the mandate of heaven, you can even be killed. That is the idea. You know, the emperor is the emperor, and you have the super respect, but if there is too much famine and wars, then next day the emperor isn't there anymore, and his uncle is the new emperor. That is how it goes. So, as always, this strong hierarchy in the system assumes a strong delivery aspect. And that goes for Weberianism as much, working Weberianism, as much as for uh, working Confucianism. All this obedience and hierarchy only work if they do their job. If they don't do their job, out they go. Why is a non-democratic hierarchical bureaucracy in Singapore legitimate? Why do the people have no problems with that? Because the life quality in Singapore is so high and they do their job so that the people say, okay, if they do it this way, as long as they do it this way, fine. But when they stop delivering, then is when you get democratic reforms. So this is, this is how, how it moves into each other and how, how it balances it. Okay, I think I'll stop here to give even more things. Thanks. The two more discussions to go. So now I would like to invite Professor Yan Yizhang from the uh, Zhonghua University to uh, deliver his talk. Uh, also, thank you for this uh, 
I mean, the list the dialogue. Uh, I also want to thank the director. She invited me to be here. And I also learned a lot from the Dr. Wolfgang. And also, I just have the two opinions. One is uh, from the Max Weber bureaucracy, we can see the, the bureaucracy was not built uh, by the market. Let's, uh, that's something I think the, just like the car, this car is designed for the normal use, just normal car. It's not support, not designed uh, uh, to the su su supports car. So it's different. Sometimes uh, uh, institutional design, uh, that will uh, let me think uh, how to put the market into the, the bureaucracy. Something, maybe sometimes something is wrong, maybe it's right. I just uh, don't have the really answer. I just thinking. Uh, second is uh, uh, when I was a uh, master program student, uh, 2001. I, I I wrote a paper talk about the uh, new public management. Uh, after about uh, you know uh, 13 years, uh, I don't have the, any uh, NPN paper about this. Why? Because I still watch this the this the development. Uh, uh, no matter in the global in Taiwan, uh, I think the if we if we uh, want to use the NPA in Taiwan, we needed some uh, I mean the uh, evidence base to to I mean the uh, two case by case case study to see what happened, and uh, if we use the long tour, I mean the long tour of the NPA, how we revise. The policy, maybe the policy, how we revise the the, the tool. Uh, so the second point is uh, I really really care why. Because the we can use the MPA tool no problem, but we need to see what happened in Taiwan, and uh, compare to the other countries, and we know how to uh, take the next step. Uh, I just have the very sim simple, my, just my opinions. Thank you. And to talk about the paper, I want to invite everyone in this room that last year uh, Professor uh, uh, Drexler provided a paper in our very open uh, OPA. It's an open public administration review. And perhaps this year you should provide us another one and with a bigger, because last year you, you know, your paper was only 10 pages. And we really want to learn you know, something more about the NPM. So maybe this year, 30 pages? No. Uh, OK, so now I want to invite Professor uh, Guo, uh, Guo Min Fong from the University of uh, National Open University, uh, National Taiwan University, and to say something. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and Prof. and Dr. Huang. It's my pleasure and great honor to uh, have this opportunity to participate in this long table discussion. And first, I thank for Professor Xu and Department of um, and Department of Public Administration for invitation. And today, I'm also very appreciative of the, the Dr. Dresser's impressive speech. I have learned a lot, and. I uh, I all agree uh, with the uh, the viewpoint of the Dr. Dresser, and originally I have and these the three uh, opinions, but two of them are perfect uh, answered and, and and three minutes ago, I have one, only one 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 uh, opinion. My opinion is uh, my maybe my question and what is the accountability mechanism of uh, for the government. And uh, what's the, the rule of our uh, uh, um, citizenship can can play? And because the new new uh, MPM emphasized on the performance assessment of the indicators of uh, efficiency, but in 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 Taiwan, um, I I don't see uh, uh, I um, I. I can realize and um, how much extent could our citizen can involve in the per performance um, assessment. Uh, the performance uh, assessment in Taiwan may be just inside by the government officials or by the, the experts outside. Uh, the, the, our citizen can, if you, if you, um, 
the approach our system can evaluate, evaluate our our the efficacy of our efficiency of our government is only um, based on the elections. And my, my opinion is is uh, as, uh, similar to Dr. Huang and that that is uh, mentioned before. And if we uh, we we can find a positive uh, positive relation between the performance and the, its 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 power in yeah, and it can and get guaranteed its its uh, power of the the government. I I I can see the the positive relation between between them. So maybe and um, maybe this is the, my my question to to uh, ask the 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 uh, doctor address or the the expert here. Do you think the direct government uh, mechanism is uh, the democracy uh, government uh, mechanism is uh, important to to us or, or in your country? Thank you. Where do I start? Okay, um, Max Weber. What was his day job? How did he get his money? I mean, think about it. The 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 writings about the Weberian model that we have, and this goes back to your point, is in a book published in 1922 called Wirtschaft und Gesellschaft. That means in English, economy and society. Max Weber was a professor of economics, and he was not developing a normative model of bureaucracy, but an empirical model by saying the most successful mass industrial societies, that is his key term, are uh, propped up by a solid bureaucracy that helps them and builds a framework for economic growth. That was his point. And it also, by the way, gives you an evaluation criterion right there, again. So this is already part and parcel of the Weberian system. A Weberian bureaucracy that is not linked to both citizen satisfaction and economic growth is on oddity. Citizen satisfaction and economic growth. You know what is the difference between these two criteria? Economic growth can be measured very easily. Of course, there are still differences of what kind of growth you want, but economic growth, export, whatever, this can be measured. Citizen satisfaction, that's so important for you and your questions, is such a difficult thing. And one of the reasons why it's difficult to measure is because, and again I refer to some recent research, so-called happiness research, people don't know what makes them happy. People don't know what they want. They say one thing, they do the other. James Sorovetsky, the famous economic journalist for the New Yorker talks about this all the time. People democratically vote consistently for reforms which they know don't work, are too expensive. Citizens always want the government to spend more than the government have and then they complain that they have to pay too high taxes. You can get a consistent democratic vote on more spending than people want to pay. Now from where? What do you do with that? And they don't know what makes them happy. M many people, I'm sure you also know that, think that cars make them happy. Cars don't ever make you happy. Not for long. Six weeks about. So there is a big, big problem with this ha uh, happiness research and, and with these um, hard data. So, so there is the thing. But um, what does the government, you know, what right does the government have to take your money and invest it in a top-down approach? Well, part of this happiness research, Derek Bock, the former Harvard president, wrote a very interesting book about that two years ago. Um, that, that, of course, assumes that the government knows more uh, what makes people happy than themselves. And this is indeed the debate. How do you set the standards? That was your question. How do you say what the criteria are? In the end, they are discursive. That means they emerge out of the human to living together in a certain place at a certain point. And the less prejudices you have, the more open you are to certain systems. Um, most people don't like tyrannical regimes where they go to jail and are tortured. That's kind of obvious. But once you have halfway decent living together, there are graduals. And it seems that it's not so much the big systems as how the systems are run that matters. This is what I tried to say with the Singapore versus Romania example before. You get freer authoritarian regimes than democracies. Ideally, you have a free democracy, of course. But still, this is where it is. Um, yeah, I, I think looking at the time in, in very brief, one can, one can already put it at this level. Um, 
in the end, most people would say that you need both responsible and responsive government. The Western philosophical tradition starts by Aristotle and the Politica. I quoted that yesterday already at the Central Police University. Um, is that the state comes into existence to guarantee survival and it stays in existence to guarantee the good life. That means the first thing is you don't want to be bothered, you don't want invasions from the outside and criminals from the inside, and when that is guaranteed, you want to live well. First of all, no starvation and no fear, no cold and so on, and after that it should be a bit fun and you want to participate and so on. So, at the given points and in stages of, if you will, development or, shall we say, change, the state performs in a different way. Um, that, um, that a state that only runs after the results of public opinion polls is also not a good state because it has to provide leadership, equality, standards, and so on, seems to be a current consensus by many people, especially outside of the United States of America. I would almost leave it at that, and that has been a really great discussion, but um, as far as your point of publishing this is concerned, of course, my views on NPM and so on, I have published already quite a bit, so to repeat your old stuff and update it, this is a bit on the boring side, but here is an interesting thing. As most Western scholars, to say this once again in English, that doesn't make a difference for me. It's not for me. We talked about the publishing is a big advancement. But I would love to have an NPM piece in traditional Chinese. So if you want to publish it in Chinese, where actually people can read it also more easily here, but that is also, for me, a cultural achievement. So if we can agree on a non-English but translated version, anything is possible for me as for many, many of my colleagues. So thank you very, very much for your excellent points. Thank you. You remind me that um, once Steve Jobs says customers don't really know what they want. And uh, it's just like um, what you have just said. And now I want to use this chance to thank you everyone in this room and especially want to thank um, Professor Dr. Um, Wolfgang uh, Drexler and to come to our university for the second time. And I want to use this chance to close this uh, conference. And thank you very much. Thank you.